Okay, we continue with the summary. Does any of you pay any attention to the World Championship in chess, by the way? So you have registered the recent development? That's good. No, he won. Okay. Uh, <laughs> then, um, maritime transport continued. Uh, international shipping policies. Um, because shipping, as well as air transport, is an international business, goes between countries, goes between various jurisdictions. Uh, <coughs> the uh, a challenge is to try to regulate this, this industry uh, by reaching interna international regulations and agreements. Um, one example is, uh, is uh, regulation on, uh, on safety. Uh, another one is, uh, is connected to, uh, to uh, emissions of uh, CO2 and other, other, uh, other greenhouse gases. Uh, and this is, this is kind of difficult. A third example of regulation, which is not that common these days, is regulation on prices. We used to have so-called liner conferences, where ship, ship owners were allowed to agree on prices through negotiations. And that was kind of, uh, of strange because we are normally not allowed to, to talk, our competitors are not normally allowed to formally agree on prices. But the reason why that was, <coughs> that was uh, allowed at the time was that um, uh, to, to be make sure that enough capacity was offered to the market. And when you, when you compete fiercely in a market with increasing returns to scale and very expensive capital equipment like ships, you can actually end up in a situation where no one makes money and you get a lot of turbulence in the market with, uh, with uh, bankruptcies and things like that. But <coughs> the development has now been uh, more in the direction of uh, sh ship owners not only engaging in the sea transport leg but also in port activities, value added logistics and so on, which makes the, the, scale, uh, the scale problem of, uh, with, with respect to capacity less pronounced. So that's why they have sort of banned liner conferences more or less. I think they did it from October 2010, if I remember correctly. So the, the remaining regulations are, are, uh, are um, related to environment, safety, uh, more or less. Um, it's a liberalized sector, as I said. Uh, no restrictions to market access. A very competitive spot market, long uh, bulk trades. Uh, liner trades, <coughs> few bilateral cargo restrictions left. There are some, not within the EU because they banned it in 2010, but uh, some other countries have these closed liner conferences to agree on prices, which makes it difficult for, for others to, to enter. Um, <coughs> there are some, some reservations. With the, where the government can uh, procure uh, services as a kind of a public service, then they need to, to arrange tenders. And you have cargo of strategic importance. Cabotage is, uh, is fully allowed in, within the EU. A ship can take cargo dom and from, an, let's say, an international route, can take cargo domestically within Europe. Yeah, so this is, uh, these regulations are, uh, are, 
uh, are there. I'm not going into into detail on them. And as you can see, there is uh, there, there, it's con connected to safety and uh, and uh, environment more or less. Yeah. So, uh, and this is an example of uh, of uh, regulations. Solas to 1974, which has uh, has uh, specific regulations on uh, on safety. Um, this is a kind of regulation which is which is kind of interesting because here they are are regulating. Uh, the contents of, of uh, substances in uh, within or in marine fuels. This is uh, this is sulfur, and we see that uh, <coughs> as as time has uh, passed here, the the content of uh, of sulfur in percent has has gone down, and it will <coughs> go further down in 2015. And in in 2020, when it comes to on on the world basis, uh, this is for the EU ports, but we had a very strong demand for uh, for uh, sulfur content, which came into effect in 2010. So this is a way of sort of regulating a market by setting standards. Instead of using, uh, let's say, uh, fuel charges to sort of give economic incentives for uh, for uh, ship owners to change to less sulfur content content fuel, they say that well we don't believe this market is working uh, well enough, so we d we just set the standards. This is for uh, for NOx. Uh, which uh, has also uh, a very <coughs> strong decrease from from 2016 on, from the same for the same reasons. Um, and you <coughs> you have on your slides from that lecture uh, the development in uh, in emission standards for uh, for truck engines, which is also interesting. I think we may come back to that. Uh, which has actually helped quite a lot in reducing uh, environmental uh, impacts from uh, from road transport. So this is just a very quick summary of, of the regulations. You need to have an overview of the most important uh, regulations and why they are there. Uh, but I don't think we will demand any detailed any information on the on the specific details within the different regulations. Uh, now I would like to continue with uh, some of my own stuff here. Uh, I will now go on with this lecture five, moving a bit back and forth here, but never mind. Um, I, I gave a lecture on, uh, on uh, which introduced you to logistics and supply chain management. Some of you may have had heard some of that before. Uh, the focus here is on, on international activity and, uh, and the challenges connected to, uh, to running uh, multinational or international uh, supply chains, including transportation. Uh, there are different, different uh, functions or different uh, players within a in multinational uh, or international transport chain. The shipper, the carrier, and the consignee. <coughs> and the lecture, which I will actually not summarize, but you should, uh, you should uh, go through the, the slides for yourself, is by, by Olaf uh, Heimansen. On uh, on uh, customs and uh, and documentation, which and the inco terms uh, part that he lectured, which sort of regulates the the distribution of responsibility between the players in a in a transport chain. <coughs> 
so again there there is uh, there are different legal frameworks uh, coordination issues and of course uh, longer distances drivers of internalization we have talked a bit about them already uh, factor costs and uh, and so on um, try to, to search for new geographic areas. Also, <coughs> trying to extend the product lifetime or life cycle. Uh, I talked a bit about the car industry, which has set up uh, manufacturing sites in, uh, in developing countries, thereby extending life cycles of uh, car models that has expired in the European or American market. They are not sold there anymore, but they are made and sold as new cars in, uh, in uh, for instance, in, in, uh, in uh, Africa and in China. So if you take a taxi in uh, Shanghai, you will most <coughs> likely use a Volkswagen that was uh, sold in Europe in the early 90s, which is manufactured as a new car there. So it's a way of extending life cycles. And by that, you can also be able to exploit economies of scale, because you have put a lot of research and development and uh, thinking into uh, developing a car model. And it's good to try to extend the life cycle of that and to, to, to make profits fr from that. Globalization <coughs> and what drives globalization? Centralization, economies of scale again, time to market, uh, which may be an issue, of course. We talked about the challenge connected to the credit crunch in 2008 and the delay of shipments from, uh, from Asia to, to Europe. Uh, you introduce risk into this picture which we dealt with, I'll come back to that. Um, concentration at specific sites for specific reasons, as, we, as I talked about a bit later on, uh, sorry, earlier on. Uh, industrial clusters, which may be, it may be profitable to be a member of, of an established industrial cluster. And it may also, of course, be attractive to be, uh, be close to, to natural resources like oil and gas, or minerals. Comparison of national and international logistics pipelines uh, was a part of uh, this lecture on international logistics. You see, you see a, uh, a list of factors here. And to understand the fundamentals of supply chain management and supply chain risk is important from this lecture, in an international perspective. So for instance, uh, a question like, discuss supply chain risk in an international perspective. It's a wide open question, and uh, you will have the possibility to answer that based on, uh, on what you have at hand on the exam. Because the exam will be an open book exam, so you can take, carry with you whatever you like of paper. Um, but the questions will be then a bit on, you need to use the literature and the lecture notes to, to try to think uh, about how to answer some of the questions. If a question like I just mentioned is post, discuss, um, supply chain risk in an international perspective, you should be able to, to, to carry out a, such a discussion based on what you have at hand. So uh, the summary of, of the lecture five and six, which was um, introduction to logistics and supply chain management and international logistics can be summarized like this. You have seen this uh, before. 
and this is very this is kind of very specific advices to people who are going to to engage in this business to understand the true cost of sourcing overseas meaning uh, you may run into problems with uh, with uh, having suppliers in in uh, in, di in in different culture in, in different parts of of the world, uh, <coughs> which may cause concerns with respect to calculating the transport costs, uh, also like providing uh, backup service. Uh, exchange of knowledge, uh, emergencies, and so on. But it also <coughs> affects risk, and and uh, and to try to understand the risk factors connected to this is uh, is important. Focus on eliminating variability of trans uh, of transit times to reduce variance in transit times is uh, is important. Uh, some types of cargo may live well with a certain amount of variance, whereas others may not. Uh, may not it may not be uh, feasible for other types of cargo to have a high variance in transit time. Um, the attempts that have been made to use the Northern Sea Corridor north of Russia has been done by bulk carriers, which is not that time critic, <coughs> because they have been, they have one of the first shipments that were, that used that corridor had to wait for three weeks to get uh, uh, a Russian icebreaker to escort them. Okay, so so I mean, if you then have perishables or uh, or high value uh, containerized uh, goods, you would not like to to suffer from that kind of delay. But if you have a bulk uh, load, which perhaps is uh, where the of quite low value. And maybe they have ordered it early so that they have a fair amount of inventory, uh, a buffer for such delays. It may not be a, that big problem. Yeah, tariff engineering. <coughs> Source and manufacture products uh, to take advantage of classification duty rates and so on. It does also has to do with location to be able to locate in, uh, in an area where you can take advantage of uh, low uh, customs rates and so on. We also went through a very simple exercise on location based on a multi-criteria assessment analysis, which is also uh, something that could be, could be, uh, I might, present you the very simple location problem. Okay, consolidate. <coughs> Try to exploit economies of scale again by, by, uh, by for instance, entering into agreements with uh, other, other carriers that have uh, less than container loads. Try to merge cargo to, to, save, to save money. Present the costs of transport, cost of carrying inventory, inventory, and also the the, the risk factors connected to uh, to uh, say making decisions about where to source your uh, supply your supplies from, where to locate, and so on. So uncertainty can be brought into into that picture as well. Options, option thinking. Compliance procedures, <coughs> which is more like uh, document flows and uh, things that I guess Olaf Hermansen was talking about. Avoid 
emergencies. Uh, try to avoid sending things on a very short notice that could be planned well in advance. It's uh, the Norwegian oil and gas gas sector is an expert in violating this principle. They can say that well we need this item tomorrow, and then. Uh, a lot of costs are spent to, to get that item uh, to where it should be in time. And then <coughs> three weeks later, the, the item is still there, but it's had started the rest of it, of course, out on, out on a platform. It's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a condition for, for us. So that, that is a very, has been a very common story within that sector. That, that, uh, Express services has perhaps been used to a too large extent. Then back again to Yellis. Uh, lecture on, on ports. Uh, which It's a very interesting piece of, uh, of infrastructure because it's, uh, it's a point where cargo is transferred from one transport mode to another, uh, from land transport to sea transport, from sea transport via land transport to perhaps air transport. Uh, <coughs> the amount of cargo and passengers is, uh, is, uh, con con is the port's throughput. Well, it's easily measured in, in physical terms. Um, a port may consist, constitute several terminals, which may, which may uh, give a, a challenge with respect to planning, uh, for, because many ports have grown in a very organic way, and uh, there may be a problem with two, a too dispersed pattern of terminals within ports. Rotterdam is suffering a bit from that. Uh, terminals are, uh, are the places where thi things uh, take place. They may be very simple from just handling throughput and also to be units that produces something or adds value to the cargo. Seebrugge in, uh, in, uh, in Belgium, they pack most of the orange juice that is uh, that is imported into uh, into uh, into Europe. Actually, they have a quite large plant for uh, extracting the concentrated uh, orange juice that is imported from from Brazil and other countries. They add water, pack, and then ship to to Norway and other places. Um, they may also do third-party logistics services connected to uh, final uh, inspection, pre-delivery inspection of cars, and so on. So <coughs> they are they are increasingly capital intensive. A lot of exp expensive equipment. You see some of the, the gantry cranes from, uh, for uh, loading and unloading container ships there, which are expensive units. Not many of them around in Norway, because they need a high throughput of containers to be, to be profitable. So <coughs> that tells us that the scale effects, the economies of scale in ports, has become increasingly important. They are dependent upon a high throughput to be able to, to, uh, to make profits with this uh, expensive capital equipment. If you are labor intensive, if a lot of people is, uh, could have done these, uh, these operations, the scale effects are not that evident. Because then you have a variable production input, namely labor, which is very flexible. Whereas 
this capital equipment is fixed and the fixed costs are high and then you need much more throughput to be able to, uh, to, do, to, uh, to make such initial high investments profitable. So there are lots of <coughs> creative ways of, uh, of funding uh, this, uh, this equipment. Um, and at places, quite a lot of uh, public sector engagement to actually subsidize some of these fixed costs because they see the ports as, uh, as important engines for, uh, for regional uh, development. So main port types <coughs> here, local port, feeder ports and hub ports, the increasing size. Problems with port structure in, the, in a country like, uh, like Norway, we have a lot of small ports uh, locally owned and the local owners they are making profits out of, of many of the ports because they don't have <coughs> that much capital equipment they don't need that much throughput but they are a local monopolist in many cases so they can charge not whatever they like but they make quite a lot of money like the port in this town. There is a hotel located close to the, to the port where the coastal steamer and uh, the, the port that is located in the city center here. That hotel is owned by the port. They have invested their money into that hotel. And uh, I'm not going to, and you are not going to discuss local port policy but uh, there are some incentives in the structure in Norway and there are also the same in, in other countries which sort of hinder or is an obstacle to concentration and perhaps an improved productivity in, uh, in, uh, in the port sector in a sparsely populated country like, uh, like Norway. You have some of the same problem in, uh, in the United Kingdom and also in, uh, in uh, parts of Sweden. Uh, feeder ports is uh, an example is Gothenburg, which is the largest port in Norway. Not true, because it's located in Sweden. But uh, the cargo, the largest amount of cargo transported by sea, which is going to and from Norway goes over uh, Gothenburg port. So that's why I'm saying that Gothenburg is the largest port in Norway. It serves Norway. It is located in Sweden. So there is a hierarchy of ports here. And <coughs> to be able to, in international transportation, to be able to transfer cargo from, uh, from uh, to be a competitor or to, be, to make short sea shipping. This is a typical short sea shipping route going from here and down to Rotterdam. To make that route competitive with road transport demands that you have a certain amount of cargo and it demands that you have a certain concentration within the, within the port sector. So, this, uh, so that uh, trucks, instead of going directly to, to the continent, the European continent, they could perhaps feed ports and then take the cargo by, by sea down to the European continent. But so far, the, those efforts have been not very successful. A list of port functions. Just bear in mind that uh, the one important objective for a port is to try to distribute the, their fixed costs onto various functions. Not only the transportation activities, but also value.
quartz come actually uh, reduce the amount of fixed costs that has to be uh, be covered by by the transport activities you get that point you can share the fixed costs on, on more than one type of activity and the larger ports has sort of taken that point and they are developing themselves into much more than just a yeah you see here a lot of things that I can do. And the, the economic rationale for doing this within the port has to do with the cost structure. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> again, uh, competition, increasing competition between ports. Uh, much of this has to do has to do with scale effects. Uh, this has to do with, let's say, modernize investing capital equipment to to be able to uh, to operate at a larger scale. This has to do with scale effects. Uh, and uh, yeah, competition is interesting. Because uh, <coughs> ports may may uh, may then also act uh, strategically by, for instance, uh, specialize themselves in specific types of uh, of cargo, like Sebrige in uh, in Belgium, which are specialized in car imports from Japan. And they have a competitive advantage because they have a lot of land and no expensive uh, buildings for parking the cars. They park them uh, outside on, on, uh, on their land and uh, have gained a competitive position in, in that respect. So they try to specialize. Yeah. Overinvestment because of regional competition goes together with what I've said. This is not a very big problem among the bigger ports, but it might be a problem in regions like this with smaller ports, where uh, there are local monopolies that gains quite a lot of profits, and hence you can can risk uh, uh, have the risk of overinvestments. Regional development actors goes together with what I've said about diversifying the the number of activities that they are uh, the, that they are doing. Vertical integration <coughs> means, in this in this respect, to try to uh, feed in from ports that are further down in the hierarchy, local ports, regional ports, into the big ports try to, to get their hands on the cargo flows, to get, enter into long-term agreements to ensure that they have enough cargo to, to defend the, the large investments that they are, are doing. So, lecture eight, environmental performance of transport modes. Uh, <coughs> This is, this is an interesting issue with respect to, uh, to international transportation. And perhaps in particular, when you talk about short sea shipping versus road transport or rail transport. Um, because the, as, as Harald Hjelle told you, the, the common thinking about environment and sea transport is that it is, it is environment friendly. And uh, I guess he showed you some cases where that was not necessarily true. So, uh, so the conclusion is, on a, at a very high level, that you should address environmental performance of uh, various uh, transport modes in a case-specific way. Because it, because it may vary a lot uh, with respect to the origin and destination pattern of the cargo 
and, uh, and so on. This is just to, to show uh, as, a, as an introduction to how you can approach an issue like this. Is to first of all <coughs> identify the emissions that are uh, that are uh, made by various transport modes, and there are models for uh, for for doing that. Uh, <coughs> trying to find out how the change in emissions are affecting the global environment, and at best what it costs in terms in monetary terms to increase or the savings of reducing emissions and we have we have quite a lot of numbers for this there has been done a lot of research about the value of changing or reducing or increasing for that sake uh, emissions but we need to sort of do some very thorough and careful calculations here for various transport modes, how, uh, what level of, uh, of emissions do we have from road transport as compared to sea transport and so on. So all these effects that comes from a change in, in emissions are today uh, converted into prices. Let's say what does it cost per ton of CO2 to be emitted into the atmosphere. Let's say for road transport, the, the extra costs today are around uh, 300 Norwegian kroner per ton. And you can, you can uh, determine or estimate those costs based on what it takes to, let's say, keep the emissions on a certain level. Let's say that we are going to keep the emissions at the level as we are per today. If we just imagine that we agree upon that. Then we need to <coughs> know what, how high should the CO2 charges be to avoid an increase in the use of fossil fuels of different kinds. And then you need to know a bit, a lot about demand and demand elasticities and so on and so forth, which I will not uh, bore you with. But you can, in a fairly robust way, calculate how high the charges have to be to be able to limit the emissions on a level like it, uh, it, it has to be uh, in 2013, for instance. Yeah. Uh, some, uh, some he, he also showed some illustrations on, uh, on, uh, on vessel energy efficiency and the development from 1970 up to, uh, and there was a a shift in the 80s, the fuel consumption, kilogram per ton, mile, uh, and it is slightly decreasing for, for, the, for the vessels. The problem with ships is that it is, uh, they have a very long lifespan, so it takes a lot of time to replace the old bangers with new modern equipment. So. Um, and the contrast is, uh, is uh, trucks, which is replaced every fourth year, and where the new emission standards are implemented uh, on, a, on a current basis. So the, the change over time is, is rapid for, for trucks. So that is also part of the picture when it's going to, to compare environmental effects of, uh, of uh, sea versus road transport. This is just uh, an illustration of, uh, of CO2 emissions per metric ton of freight per kilometer for various transport modes. But again, <coughs> a modern ship is, uh, is the winner here. 
But it all depends on the nature of the transport. It depends on the load factors that you have, because uh, this is, uh, these numbers are based on more or less, or a ship which is almost fully laden. But if the capacity utilization is low, then the numbers becomes, uh, become different, of course. So there are, uh, so there is a certain span here, but, uh, but uh, you cannot from these numbers just conclude that sea transport is the most uh, energy or environmental friendly. Yeah, this is the, what I said earlier, this is the, the development in, uh, in uh, emission standards for trucks. We are on Euro 5 now, and the, the strongest decrease is in, in NOx, nitrogen oxide of different uh, numbers there. You see the energy use, which is the, the upper uh, line there, has not changed that much. And the solid line is CO2 emissions. Which, has, which is a very which follows energy consumption uh, closely has not changed much, but NOx has changed quite dramatically, and also uh, and also particles, which is the lower uh, line there. So he went through this case, these case studies, and uh, the conclusion was that you need to you need to be case specific, to be short about that. Yeah. Then some measures that can be taken to, uh, or means that can be taken to uh, to reduce emissions from uh, from uh, from sea transport. Everything from uh, going slow, which is an efficient way of getting rid of emissions, but it takes time, and that has to do with uh, and may raise some supply chain issues, of course. To change <coughs> to LNG for, uh, instead of uh, of diesel, and then also all the other things connected to maintenance and planning and so on. Yeah, and regulations. Yes, this goes without saying, uh, because I've said most of it already. Uh, for bulk, it's uh, clearly, uh, the sea transport is clearly in favor. Here, it is a mixed picture. Uh, and, uh, and the smaller pallet vessels, which we have quite a lot of going from Norwegian ports, they need a very good average load factor to compete with truck. So a massive transfer of uh, cargo from road to sea, uh, if that is uh, done without keeping a keen eye on capacity utilization on ships, which will, of course, all other things being equal, it will increase if you manage to transfer. Uh, but unless we manage that, it's not a very good uh, thing in terms of, uh, of energy use and, and emissions. And there is a lot of uh, things that can be said about why it is difficult to transfer cargo from road to sea. Uh, I don't think I will go into that, because that will be quite new for you. But uh, there is something with flexibility and uncertainty and, uh, and everything which uh, gives road transport a certain advantage in this, in this game. Yeah. Well, all this has to do with uh, with uh, load factors and uh, fuel consumption and adap adaptation to to the freight that is actually the, the demand that is uh, that is present. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't think I will comment more upon upon this. Yeah.
Now, we could take a break or I can just go through the rest. It's up to you, but it takes uh, another 10 minutes, I think. Should I just continue? Break. Break? Yeah. Okay. Let me break. We break. We start again at quarter past, okay? Yep. <coughs>